And this is episode two of two of our very special video episodes of Ningyo Bingo, where you keep collecting dolls but never seem to win the game. About a month ago, Lindsay and I went to Castle Point Anime Convention, and we did two panels there. Uh, one of the panels was a very lovely in-depth view as uh, on uh, dolls as visual culture. This one was a little bit more on the beginner side, uh, which is good for an animated convention, absolutely. Um, we looked into buying your first doll, uh, the pitfalls that can kind of happen to you. Um, so we're going to invite you into the lovely lovely classroom with us and sit back, relax, and enjoy the wonderful, wonderful slideshow. All right. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And I'm Lindsay. And we are the duo that are part of Ningyo Bingo, which is a lovely fledgling podcast about Asian ball jointed dolls and contemporary dolls in general. Anything related to that hobby that kind of go in this giant Venn circle is something that we want to start talking about. Or tangentially related things. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we go on tangents on occasion, hopefully entertaining ones. But also tangentially related doll things. Um, <laughs> yeah. Eventually. Um, um, but we're trying to take a little bit more of an academic angle on what we're talking about, looking at the cultural trends. Why is this this way? Not just telling you about it, but why is this happening right now? And digging a little bit further into the history, seeing what other parts of our culture that it influences. We try to it's easy just to look at a site and look at a list of dates, but it's more interesting to kind of think about why things were changing when they were changing. Put things in context. But today, and this panel, is going to be a little bit more just information-based. We're going to be talking about buying your first Asian ball-jointed doll, which, while it seems pretty simple on the surface, you find a doll, you buy it, due to the bespoke nature of these dolls and how very, like, sort of, handmade and slowly made that they are, there's a lot of elements that go into purchasing a doll that you either may not be familiar with and find overwhelming when you first try to go into purchasing them, or there may be pitfalls that you should look out for that a veteran in the hobby, of course, knows about, but how are you supposed to know what all of these things mean and all of these acronyms that people use mean and anything else? Speaking about veterans in the hobby, let's get a quick show of hands. Who owns an Asian ball jointed doll? One. One. Who has seen them before the ones you're looking at today? Oh, good. A good, a good many. Yeah. Okay. So this is your first time seeing it in person. Who is here because you really are interested in purchasing one? Woo. Yes, our thesis panel. <laughs> good. Um, so first thing we should probably describe is what the heck an Asian ball jointed doll is. Most of you probably already know, but we're going to just briefly give you a definition. Yes. Um, so Maya up here is an Asian ball jointed doll. Oh, you get to go this time, not me? Yes. All right. She is made out of resin. Um, she has joints at her shoulders, elbows, wrists, one in the middle of her hip. This is sometimes a one piece. In this case, it's two pieces here. So she can bend. Yes. Um, there's hips, knees, ankles. That's like... Sort of the, in terms of definition, if it's an Asian ball jointed doll, that's usually the minimum amount of jointing required to be officially considered an Asian ball jointed doll. And in general, when we're talking about Asia, in this case, we're talking about the major manufacturers, which are usually located in Japan, China, and Korea. Uh, we're also talking very specifically about the resin version of these dolls. There's some very many related dolls that we actually have an example in the room here. But we're not talking specifically about them. They are tangential and connected to how these guys work. But we're talking today specifically about the resin guys. Yes. Although we will have many shopping tips where one might actually apply to the other in a few cases. They're all kind of sold by similar companies and may have similar pitfalls. They are highly customizable. They have interchangeable wigs. The head cap comes off. In the back. Oh, and, she's pretty easy. And the eyes are also changeable. The faces get painted on, and they should be painted on with any medium that does not contain oil, because <laughs> resin will, is porous. Yes, and if you put something on with oil, it will soak in and it will stain the resin permanently. So, while the resin is 
a little bit de more delicate in some ways compared to say porcelain or common plastics. In other ways, they're much stronger and sturdier. So there's a trade-off there. They are a pigment will sometimes stain the resin, which is something to keep in mind when you have a doll. If you have dark clothing in the doll, you might want to change it periodically so that the pigments in the fabric don't end up leaching into the resin itself. But otherwise, they're very, very sturdy, and they will last for a long time. Or a pro tip, if you think something is highly pigmented, and you can just give it a cold rinse with some um, baby soap and kind of get out some of the excess dye that way. Yeah. No guarantees, but it's actually a little, at least a little closer in case they didn't wash easier. the fabric. Yes. So, um, Asian ball jointed dolls, there are a lot of acronyms and sort of in-house technical terms that are used often. Um, we're going to go over a few of the, when you're purchasing a doll, these are terms you're going to see that you may not know what they mean, and they're going to be used in descriptions of the doll, they're going to be used on the websites. So starting from the top, ABJD is how it's commonly turned into an acronym. BJD pretty much says the same thing without the Asia-specific part. Because we are expanding beyond We Asia have now. way expanded beyond Asia in who's making dolls in this mode. And in fact, I believe these two on the stage... These guys yeah, are not from Japan side. or Asia anywhere. Um, anyway, so face up is another term you're going to see a lot. Face up is what you see on Maya's face here. It's the act of putting the paint on, having blushing on, using pastels or other airbrushing. Having that on the face, that's called the face up. As you can see on this guy here, it might be hard from the distance because he's small. His face is small. He has no face up. It's blank resin. It's pure resin. Nothing has been done to him. We also have body blushing, which is basically the exact same thing, but referring to blushing on the body to sit, say have rosy hints at the elbows to give details on the nails. If something says it comes body blushed, it means there's details painted onto the body itself. Right, and it'll be they'll typically add blushing onto any place with heightened amounts of blood flow, which will be like neck, inner arm, uh, the downstairs areolas, etc. <laughs> Another two things that you want to be at least vaguely familiar with before you start to dive into really trying to purchase one of these guys is there's a difference between single jointed and double jointed. Single jointed refers to the basic ball and socket joint on a doll. Maya has single joints. They move fairly well, they're fairly stable, but they are limited because unlike my arm, which is fleshy and squishy, they're made out of resin and it runs into itself. So if she wants to punch herself into the face, <laughs> I'd have to actually push the joint beyond the socket and it pops out. So she can't like, you know, scratch her ear. So basically really. single joints for some people have a much more beautiful aesthetic or they may be more stable, but they don't have the range of motion that a double joint has. A double joint is something that this guy has and, I'll, and it's basically because there's two parts to the joint. Instead of having it just be a ball and a socket, there's a, there's a third piece in the middle. So I'm going to like kind of pull his arm apart. Not all of them require you to pull it out like this, but this one does it so that there's a locking mechanism to the pose. Yeah. This is a double joint. There is a peanut in the middle of the joint that gives you a little bit of extra space and movement room so that technically, if I do this correctly, without completely destroying the joint, he can then bend the arm. And it will stay there, which is very cool. Which is kind of nice, especially if posing is something that you prioritize. But not everybody likes the look of that. So that's something you're going to have to decide for yourself and your aesthetics and what you're looking for. Double joint is more flexible, not always more stable. Single joint can be more beautiful and more stable, but you lose some flexibility in the posing. Um, and at the bottom are a few really quick acronyms that you're going to see all the time. WS stands for white skin. That's what my boy is in. It's basically almost the raw resin color in white. And she used to be white skin. <laughs> she is now a pleasant ivory, I would like to say. It's what's called a yellowing. The uh, resins do are not UV stable. Um, so they will change over time when the applied to The pigments will be affected by light and perhaps either lose their intensity or change over time. Um, this means that some dolls that started out blue are now green. <laughs> Certain dismay. pigments are less light fast than others. If you've ever seen anyone talking about art museums and how they have to be really careful about light on very famous portraits or how Da Vinci portraits aren't as bright as they used to be, pigments just simply aren't stable things and light will slowly destroy them over time. But that doesn't necessarily mean they become less beautiful. Yes. Another acronym you're going to often see is NS. That's called normal skin. It means there's been some pigment added to the resin to give it sort of a pale, sort of me-ish. 
Yeah, I don't have show. anything here that is a normal skin today. Nope. <laughs> the smart doll in the front is kind of what we would consider a normal, normal skin, skin tone. She's kind of a little lighter on the normal skin tone variation, but yes. Yeah. You're also going to see the acronym LE that stands for limited edition. Limited edition is pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. You're also going to see FS, that means full set. A full set doll comes with every accessory, uh, comes with accessories, often painted, and with clothing, wigs, and eyes, which is not always standard, which is something important to keep in, tr keep in mind when you're new to looking at all of these guys. You'll often see beautiful company photos but their stage photos and the actual basic doll are going to look more like he does, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Yes. So now that we have some basic terminology down, the basic thing about this buying process is there are a lot of choices for you to make because there's a lot of options, especially in terms of like style, your aesthetic style, the image that you're trying to create, the character you may be trying to replicate. What size doll do you want to work with? They come in several sort of standard categories, which have their pros and minuses. What company do you want to work through? Some larger companies have a lot of customer support. If you get something wrong in your order, they'll very quickly solve it. Some companies are small artists working in their basement, doing it by hand, and may have a different challenges. And you have to keep that in mind about what you're willing to put out as risk or not when you're making a purchase. Another thing, <laughs> most important, budget. But these dolls do range in price from about $150 to upwards of $3,000, depending on what company it is, how large the doll is, is it a limited edition, etc. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And also, what is your buying method? There is at least four methods for actually obtaining a doll, and that all depends on what you're looking for, what your price point is, and what is available to you. I am talking awful fast, so if you have any time for a question, please feel free to put up your hand and we'll stop for a moment and explain something. Or like throw things at me, just miss the dolls. Yeah, you can hurt us, not them. Yeah, okay. We cost less to fix. So, depends on your insurance. Depending on your insurance. <laughs> so let's get into size ranges, which is something you may not be familiar with if you're not really deep into the hobby. So what are we seeing here? This is the size range chart for Volks, who is the company who sort of founded this specific part of this hobby. A lot of the sizes you're gonna see websites referring to, like SD size and SD13 size, what they're referring to is the Volks terminology, in-house terminology for their size ranges. And SD sounds for Super Dolphy, which is their trademarked line of these dolls. So as you can see here, they range from the super, super tiny, this guy's about this big, to their SD-17 range, in particular within Volks, which is about yay big. Yes. and They're huge and will hurt you if you drop them. And because they were kind of the first guys on the boat, they were the first ones to kind of mass produce, uh, make it from like kind of art dolls into a hobby kit, uh, they have taken this name and... The Consumers have used it a la someone would use Band-Aid instead of adhesive bandage. Band-Aid is a brand name, but it became so ubiquitously connected to the object that we just call them Band-Aids. Yes. Also like the word Kleenex. They're facial tissues, technically, but we all call them Kleenexes because when you see them, you just think Kleenex. Yes, which is why someone like look at this and call it a Dolphy. It's technically not, not a Dolphy. Not a Dolphy. <laughs> uh, but it's a different yes. company who use different names. Which is, so the... Floor large blanket term was once again ancient ball jointed doll. Yeah. So we're talking about size ranges. What sizes are we talking about? Here's the common sizes you're going to see referred to and what their equivalent things are across websites. Some websites will say SD. Some will say the scale in terms of versus human scale, what the scale is. Some will use an in-house specific term to that company, but they're all going to be working within these same general categories and they all have benefits and detriments depending on what you want to do. Um, but we're going to start in the middle with the SD. SD size means Super Dolphy. That was the first type of ball jointed doll that was made, so it's considered your basic size. It's about, we don't actually have an example of that size with us because they are large and heavy and annoying to carry. And I was already bringing two. Um, yeah. Uh, the smart doll in the front of the room is actually about the height of a Super yeah. Dolphy, though much slimmer than the average one on uh, sale. Yeah. So SD, that term is about 22 inches high. It will also be referred to as one-third scale. 
And they're often talked about in height in terms of centimeters because, because Asia, America is the <laughs> only place in the world that does not use centimeters. No, there's, a, there's like one other, I can't remember. Anyway, we're like the last holdout for this. There's one other holdout. And you can kind of consider them your basic large doll. And the next size down is MSD or mini super dolphy, which we do have an example of the actual sizes here. You can see they're a little different, but they're both considered MSD. MSD is considered one fourth scale, one size smaller. They're also a, they usually range between 40 to 55 centimeters tall, or also about 17 inches. And you can kind of think of them as your medium size. Yes, and originally they kind of had more childlike feature, features than the one third scale size, so they kind of almost acted as like children a, compared to the they, other ones. Right. That being said, from there we've uh, evolved to having all sorts of maturities and sculpts and all sorts of sizes. For example, this guy is technically MSD size, but he does not look like a child. Not at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> no. And even between these two, um, this lovely lady has a much slimmer waist than this girl who is much bulked up. Yeah. And even when we look up here, before where you look at MSD and what's on the right there, SDC, Super Dolphy Cute. Which is a whole different thing. <laughs> uh, you'll notice on their waistlines, one is a lot slimmer than the other. And once again, they're going for that more mature hourglass look, but just a different scale for the doll. Um, going on through the scales, the common scale terms you're going to see in communities as well as on websites. YoSD stands is from the Volks' term YoTenshi, which is about a 10-inch doll. About 10 inch size. They're often called tinies, the dolls in these size. They're usually about yay big. They're smaller than your average Barbie. Yeah. What's nice about them is that they're very small. They're easy to take care of. You're not as concerned about them falling because they don't weigh as much. And you can kind of easily take them around or put them in positions within different things in your home. And it's important to note while they're about as tall as a Barbie, they once again have more of a child uh, appearance. They're thicker around in the middle. Right. They're heavier. So it's like a child doll that's that size yeah. rather than a slim model that that's yeah. that size. So that's usually called a tiny. And then we have, just to give you some sense of comparison, a fashion doll, which is basically your basic Barbie, runs about 16 inches. They don't have a scale because they're a weird, their own wonky scale of human body. And if you're wondering about this one-third and one-fourth scale, how to imagine it, Dollhouse scale is called one twelfth scale. Yay big. So what the scale is talking about, one third scale means that if I was a human being and you made a one third scale copy of me, it would be one third my height. Probably about knee height. About knee height, which these guys actually do run. Yes. Um, the one scale we didn't talk about was uh, what we, we like to call a bit larger. Because <laughs> um, they are a bit larger. So starting with uh, Tensia and the Hounds and I think and a few other companies... They uh, went a size larger than SD. So instead of being about one-third scale, they kind of go one head higher. Yes. Which, and they're like, So it's, it's kind of like one-third scale, but one-third scale for somebody that's like six feet tall. Uh, <laughs> like so our friend Jamie. Initially, they were like lanky, muscly, masculine, mostly males that came out. Um, so they were kind of cool like boys. that. And you wouldn't think that a head taller would do much, but man, that adds a lot of heft in the resin. It's like, it's a, it's a lot the, about the size. As you go bigger in size, it's a little bit easier to get things in scale with them because they're a little larger. What's in scale with a larger doll can be easier to find. They are heavier. They will be more expensive, but they are a little bit more easy to customize because you can really get your hands on them. Tinies are really cheaper. They're a little bit easier to handle, but they're so. But when something is smaller, it's harder to customize them because you have to be really careful. Because like one of these, like a big swipe on a big doll doesn't look so bad, but a big swipe on a tiny doll can look pretty bad. Yeah, and you have to be more careful. And the tinier you go, the more important those seam allowances are. Yeah, making stuff for them. So. St figuring out your size range in terms of budget and what you want to handle is important. It's also related to what size clothing you're going to have and what those clothing sizes tend to relate to these scale sizes. SD clothes will generally fit other SD size dolls with some caveats in there. But before going down in that rabbit hole, I want to talk about style. Even here in front of us right here, we have a wide range of style from a fairly sort of, what was it called? Stylized sort of sort of anime influence style to a very realistic one. In terms of your personal aesthetic, it's very important to follow what you want and what appeals to you. If you're really appeal like if you really like the anime style look, look for a company that specializes in that style. 
If you really like a super realistic look, that exists for you too. Um, the companies here happen to be Ipple House. This is a, they who specialize in very realistic, rugged, rugged guys. Um, the one in the middle happens to be from Delph Lutz. They do a fairly soft anime style. And some companies go completely off this range, completely into very unique, very artist-specific styles that either you, some, like you might like it or you might not like it. But you really want to think about what style fits what you like to do and what will make you happy. Oh. And that's extremely important. What, what was that uh, company again on the far right? On the far right is Dol Chateau. Thank you. Thank you. Dal Chateau is, is very well known for a very lanky, very over-stylized, almost alien. alien-looking kind of body, but they're really poseable. Yeah. <laughs> so there's every company can be extremely different from each other, especially depending on which artist is their in-house artist doing the sculpting. And you might even see them change over time as their artists yeah. change. Just to give you even more of a sense of the breadth of width, don't limit yourself to thinking this is just what I have. If you really like dragons, like me... There are Dragon Ball jointed dolls. This happens to be a picture I took. He's right there. Um, there's creatures. There's small fairy children that are about this big that would be sort of fairy size compared to you. There is no limit on what you're able to do or what people are putting on offer. So when you're looking for a ball jointed doll, look at everything. You might be surprised by what you find attractive or what you get really excited about. Putting together this slide, I did not know that the, the sheep looking guy in the end was a thing that existed, and now I really want one. So that was a double-edged sword there. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's dear mine. Okay. Yes, yeah, dear mine. Okay, I know every they company cats, is really. They start doing cats. Yeah, they started out doing cats, and now they do this. But it's like all over the map. Take your time. Look at everything. Find something that you like because the price is up there. But I'm just going to briefly also talk about the resin colors or what we call skin colors. Most companies these days will have white. What they call these these are loaded words, but it's the words that they use. There's white skin, which we mentioned before. This guy's basically a white skin. That's what they mean by that. Normal skin is about the uh, Marai Smart doll that we have in the front of the room with a kind gentleman who came to visit us. And they these days they have what they call a brown. Sometimes they'll call it a tan or mm. sunlight skin. Sunlight escapes of oaks, yes. Usually when they're talking about the browns. They're talking about a shade similar to Maya here, but tans are hard to make. For whatever reason, the pigments that go into making the brown aren't very stable, will often be marbled when they're mixed into the resin, and takes a lot of man hours. So white and normal skin tend to have not too much of a price impact. Tan skin will, at the minimum, add $50, 50 yeah. to $100 extra to the price. Depending on the scale of your doll. They're harder to make, they take more man hours, and they have a lot of lot more bad pieces to good pieces when they make a tan. But some people love tan. Yes. They just collect only tan, and it's something that's important to them, and it works really well for them, but there is a price impact to the skin color. Now, in addition, we also get uh, really cool limited editions with fantasy colored skins. Like some companies purple. That, purple, <laughs> yes. Or I've actually seen one that like, completely looks like ebony pure black like black black yeah it was really cool like black ink black yes which was really really neat those are usually limited because as we said the pigments are hard to make stable within the resin and it's important to note with resins one company's normal skin is not necessarily another company's normal skin. there's no pantone swatch that everybody uses right and so on forums that you can reference that people will take swatches and compare things to make sure that they match when they try to hybrid dolls to get exactly what they want. As a side note, hybrid and me hybriding means taking a head from one company, a body from a different company, and putting them together because for whatever reason, the aesthetics that you want aren't found within the same company. It's not something we're going to go into now because it can get very complicated, <laughs> but it exists and is possible, and knowing your skin tone matches really helps you a lot with that. So what do you get when you buy a doll? When someone, at a company website, if they say basic doll, they do not mean it comes with clothes. It does not come with a wig. It may come with eyes. A basic doll looks pretty much like this guy does. Minus his pants. Minus the, no clothing. Yes. It'll come with a head that is blank. It will come with a blank body. And if you're lucky, it will come with random eyes. That's what people usually mean when they say basic doll. Some companies and some small artists will 
sort of expand beyond that and they'll offer different services because it's something they believe in. For example, the basic Mirai doll who we have up front, she is never sold without a face up on her. But that's very specific to that company, but it is something to keep in mind when you're researching. A basic doll is generally going to be your cheapest doll bought new from a company because it doesn't really come with much. But if you are interested in having these extras, Many companies will allow you for an extra price, have it done in company for you. They'll usually offer what they call a basic face-up. A basic face-up is one where you have no input into it. That's just a face-up that they do on that head every single time. It's usually about a $50 to $100 extra purchase price. You can usually buy clothes at the same website where you're buying the doll. If you buy clothes from the same company, you can pretty much guarantee they're going to fit because they're designed for their line of dolls. And they'll sort them by their sizes on the website. So it'll be SD, MSD, or one-third, one-fourth. They'll be separated out on the website. But you can go to secondary sources for these things, but that requires then a little bit more footwork on your point to double check, make sure everything fits. Because just because this website's SD and this website have SD, doesn't mean those clothes are going to fit on each other. So then you start comparing things like hip sizes, sizes. of the two dolls and everything Most else. Most companies these days will give you all the measurements of the doll so you can do a little bit of matching. Or you, so you can go crazy and try to tailor everything before it arrives. <laughs> <laughs> Not recommended because sometimes you get things and you're in love with them and they don't fit mm. and it's upsetting. Mm. But you can also usually buy wigs from these same websites. But these are all considered extras, yes. not a basic doll. Except for, say, Mirai, because Danny Chu loves us, and he likes to give us a complete project. <laughs> um, face up. sometimes we look out, and they'll give us option A and option B. That's, That's about like it. a dark or a natural. Yeah, like very basic kind yeah. of things. But what if you say, I want a complete object. I'm invested in the vision of the artist who made this thing, or I'm not really interested in going, figuring out how to put the face up on. I don't want to have to figure that out. But I saw something, and I want that. That's called a full set, and they're usually sold in limited editions. A full set comes with everything you see, including the eyes, the face-up, the clothing, and the accessories. There may be some options that you have to choose. For example, Soom. An example of Soom's full sets is on the far left here. No, that's their right. They're, your far right, because I can do directions. <laughs> your far right there, that's a Zoom example of a full set. They often will sell the full sets with options where you can buy as much of the full set as you feel comfortable spending money on. Or they may, you can choose whether or not every part is blushed to help you manage the prices into a price point that you can afford or something that's easier for you to afford. But when, uh, when someone says full set, it means it comes with everything-ish. For example, in this picture, there's a, there's a chair she's sitting on. That's not part of the full set. That's part of them showing off the doll. And the sword may or may not be pull of, part of the full set. It's something that when you're looking at these from the company themselves, do the extra research. Make sure the companies should specify exactly what comes with the doll. And it's important to double check that because I've seen more than one person say, but I thought the sword was included. And if you go to the website to the bottom where they where it sort of lay out exactly what comes with the full set, the sword wasn't included. Yeah, and you don't want to pay the extra shipping to get it back across the ocean just for the <laughs> sword. You might get that all together in one shot. Yeah, because most of these times you're going to be ordering from someplace overseas, have custom fees involved. There's a lot involved in the ordering process, yes. which we'll get to. But these full sets, because they're so intensive on the parts of the artists, and we're dealing with companies that may be no larger than 20 people, with maybe 10 of them being craftsmen, if not less. They're usually sold in limited editions, where they're open for a period of time for order up to a certain amount of pieces. Say it's a limited edition of 500. They will only sell, sell up to 500 of them, and after that they will never be made again. And there's kind of two different flavors of full set slash limited edition. Uh, what I would call a full limited edition are like Amy Ayase in the <laughs> Dead Center, which Lindsay did not win the lottery to buy it. Three times! Three. I tried three times in three separate lotteries um, and, and failed every time. And so every time on Nino Bingo, we mention Amy to make me sad. Um, so <laughs> Amy Ayase and then the uh, lovely fantasy Sum on the right, um, they are both what I would call a full limited edition. Those sculpts, those heads. The are head sculpt. And the possibly even the body, in the case of the, the fantasy uh, version, are only released for that limited period of time. And that's, for me, true calling of limited edition. Now when we yes. call something kind of the separate idea of a full set, 
On the left, from Fairyland, we have this lady in this lovely full set outfit. It's really only the outfit that's in limited edition. And um, maybe th- and the makeup and the eyes. Right. Um, so after a period, they're going to stop selling her like that, but they'll still sell her as a basic, either a blank doll or with a more, uh, on the lines of their more average face-up kind of deals. Like with a default basic that's not quite as intensive or has as much work put into it as, say, a full limited edition would. So if you fall in love with a full set and it's too expensive... You might have luck just saying, you know what, I'm just in love with the face and body. I don't need all those clothes, or maybe I can get them on the secondhand market later. (laughs) And we're going to be talking about the secondhand market in a little bit. Another thing you really want to keep in mind while you're doing your ordering process, what kind of company am I dealing with? It's usually pretty easy to tell right away if you're dealing with a large, a small, or a atelier company. Large companies are going to have a lot more options for you. They may have English-facing websites with full English-speaking customer support. They are, almost all of these are going to be typically what we call mail order or bespoke pieces. They're made to order, which means they're going to take several months to be completed. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. A larger company may have a faster turnaround time because they have more manufacturing behind them and they can make more pieces per order set. For, like, order, rolling order set. Or if you're looking into forms, you might find that they have a longer waiting time because they got really, really popular during an event period and they're backlogged. <laughs> like, these are very small companies, even the large ones. Yes. Small companies, you're going to know it's a small company because they may or may not have full English services in terms of their customer support. The English translated on the website may be less stellar than on a larger company who can afford a better translator. Um, they may or may not sell internationally. You may have to find other ways to obtain them. And small companies are more likely to work on a pre-order basis with the limiteds because they're a small group and they can only handle so many orders at a time. They're not going to take more than they can handle. Right, and uh, by doing a pre-order, they make sure that 500 people don't order in the first three minutes that they open a sale. And then they can't fulfill all those orders. And it's kind of like trying to fit everybody into the artist alley slash dealer's room like today. (laughs) It's exactly (laughs) like the same situation. You're you're waiting in line, you're like, but I want to pay for it. But But I can't. Shut up and let me give you my money. Basically. (laughs) Um, Small artist ateliers, I actually do have, my two dolls here are from small artists who are basically one-man operations. They're going to maybe have little, if if it, you're talking, we're talking about if it's a Japanese atelier or a French atelier artist, they may have no English access. There may be no way to really contact them in any other language. They may or may not serve internationally because that is a lot, doing international mailing puts a lot of risk on the person doing the mailing, especially when we're talking about the prices of these guys. And they may be, but the styles are going to be very individual. But one difference you're really going to see is that they may be self-cast. Not in a manufacturing situation where they have large tubs and they can do vacuum forming and all sorts of other kinds of high quality resin work. Not less vacuum forming, more they they put a vacuum on the uh, a resin right to bring the bubbles out. So it kind of because this is a thick substance and it gets bubbly and then there's a bubble in it and it's in a bad place. It doesn't look very nice. Right. So any bubbles that are on a surface when it hardens fully will obviously remain be visible. there and it'll be a pocket on your doll on a place that is hopefully not noticeable so if you're dealing with a small artist and you fall in love with a small artist like i did the person who does the dragon here she does self-cast pieces the quality of the resin is not going to be as smooth and creamy as these guys but for me that was a trade-off i was willing to make on the big companies if a piece doesn't come out right they go bullshit <laughs> and they just make another one. Yeah, that's it. That's, it's they're going to give. They have more that they're living up to. So you'll get more unique, smaller things with the ateliers, but the re- the quality is going to be as individual as the pieces. So what about budgets? These are average, sort of averagey prices for each size range. And you'll notice there's a lot of variation in that, and that's kind of accounting for full sets. Um, that's also because different companies. Put, have different price points. You can find a really beautiful SD doll for less than $400, I think. Yes. But you have to go to the right company. These days, there's a wide range of companies with a wide, wide range of budgets and styles intersecting, which is why it's really important to do your research and your footwork 
to take a look at all the availabilities and to know in your head how much money you can pay, lay out. And in addition to this, uh, the companies are spread across the world in Japan, China, Korea, Russia, France, Russia, France um, the U.S. And as you go across here, different people have different living expenses and the U.S. dollar applies to things differently. And thereby the things goods you are buying from there will be a little different. Priced. Um, you also have to keep in mind customs fees. We're pretty lucky in the U.S. Our custom fees aren't that bad because we have agreements with several other places and dolls kind of fall under a luxury goods clause. So if you're in the EU and buying from someone else, you may have to buy, you may have to pay up to half the price of the doll in customs fees. You Which sucks. And also these are heavy objects that are being shipped. So when you look at the price of a doll, it's not just that number. It's that plus at least $60 or so. There's going to be shipping costs as well. So make sure that when you're budgeting for this, that you have that in mind, that there's going to be shipping costs and there may be custom costs, depending on where it's coming from and who, and what state you're in, even. Um, but wait, there's a way to buy dolls locally that come from overseas. Yes! <laughs> there's a way to buy locally, and that's through an authorized dealer. How do you find authorized dealers? Most of company websites will have a separate section telling you who their de authorized dealers are in which countries. What, the, what this does, and it gives you an intermediary between you and the company. Say it's a company that doesn't have great English support. Maybe Mint on Card has a great Korean translator on staff and they're doing all the legwork for you about building a, rep a c connection to that company. But you have someone who speaks English who can really work with you on any issues you have or layaway programs you want to do to help you figure out what you want to do. Most, and, most of the time, directly through a company, you don't have the option of doing a layaway. A lot of these local um, dealers do do things like layaway because they uh, come from, a lot of them originated from like fashion doll and things like that. So they're used to larger price tags. So they have developed yes. a system of layaway In for specific, you. specific, Mint on Card, which is a dealer that is located in the Midwest, they will do exchanges of broken pieces when the company sometimes won't. So you get a little bit of a safety barrier as well when you're working through an authorized dealer who is legitimate because they can do things that you can't and because they get so much money, they're giving so much money and business to that company, they have leverage with them and they can kind of nudge them into doing things that maybe they won't normally do. And they're not yeah. buying in bulk. They are. They're, you, we're, working, we're talking about well, the hundreds of dollars. The, these dealers are working in the thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars in orders. Not that they have too many things on hand, because even when you order from a dealer, it usually takes time from them to ship their bulk of everything they ordered within the month. They usually do bulk mailing, so you may be in the next two months' worth of mailing. Yes, so it still take time, and sometimes it'll take... Longer than if you order directly, but you have that added thing where you're not paying from the shipping. There's like there's more Japan. safety, and the full sets we were talking about earlier. If a full set is sold out on the company website, the dealer may still have them. And I have seen at least one instance uh, where Volks was on the tail end of re <laughs> relieving a lot of places of their uh, dealer privileges, and there was because they made a company decision about it. Yes, there was one place that had. Uh, full sets that had been sold out for about four or five years on the website still. People don't think about looking here, so sometimes you can find a steal, especially if it's a limited, they're trying to move. Yes. But this brings us to another question. How do you tell a legitimate dealer from an eBay recast seller? Okay, so what's a recast? So a recast is a term used for any, for specifically, usually like resin style dolls or figures or models. This is not just restricted to the dolls. There's mo figures are also have recast issues because these are things that you can make a you could make a mold of Maya and then pour in resin and make a copy of her. There's some there are some problems that go into having to the recasting process. It's not going to be exactly the same as the thing that was cast because the mold making process in introduces imperfections and shrink shrinkage. There's a few other issues as well. So when there's imperfections and shrinkage, you might have more bubbles on the skin of the, the outside surface of the resin. The quality may be lower. The joints might not fit in properly anymore because it doesn't necessarily mean everything shrunk at the same rate and everything, so it might not fit so in So say right. that your elbow shrunk more than the cup socket it went into during the mold making process, it's not going to be as stable anymore. Right. And, uh, or maybe the, it, it was already a tight fit for the elastic and now it's smaller and now it's rubbing and something breaks. Or uh, also, maybe they don't 
pay attention or do as much diligence on the pores of the molds or things. And when you're talking about areas that were already thin and small to begin with, if they become smaller, they might become brittle. So things like eyelids on recasts, you can put a flashlight through it and it shows through like rice paper or ears. And that means that things. if you kind of slip with, say, a pointy object, you're more likely to go through the resin. The yes. companies are really invested in making a more solid product because it's connected to their reputation and they're a little bit more invested in, in that way. So it's something to keep in mind. The, and when you're online looking for a really good price, sometimes you'll see what looks like a really good steal. But if you take a moment to really look at the listing, is this an authorized dealer or a non-authorized dealer? If it's not an authorized dealer, it can be a little... But the product you're going to get is not going to be what you see. So? Because they're not capable of doing what the actual company does in terms of finishing quality and paint work. And it's not the artists doing the paint work. So it's not going to look the same. Well, this looks the same. This looks like a company photo right here. But can't a company photo, Becca, be saved from any website? Uh, I guess so. That right click and, you know, save Right click and save. Yeah. So one thing to look for, especially even in the secondhand market, you want to see individual photos of the actual piece that look like it's a unique doll. The company photos are beautiful and give you a great idea what the doll looks like, but it gives you no idea, especially on, say, eBay, whether or not this is the actual company or is it somebody who's pretending to be the company It's asking for money from you, saying, I'm sh doll chateau, and then in the end, you, maybe you get a product that you didn't actually want to pay for because it didn't come out the way that you were expecting from them. This is pretty cool, though. We get the doll. We got a face up. We got eyes. Um, what's on the end there? It kind of cut off. It just says it's Christina full set. Oh, full set. So then we have outfits too, right? That's what you think. But the other thing about recasters, because, or not, necess not even necessarily recasters, say it's somebody who is not working with as an authorized dealer. Someone who isn't an authorized dealer, they may not actually have all these things. And one way you can tell is, does this, is this legit or not? This eBay listing has a buy it now price of around $300. Okay. Which sounds like a great steal, but let's look at what the price looks like on an actual dealer's website. Okay, so this was... Oh, this looks like Mint on Card. This is Mint on Card. Yes. Who is an official Dal Chateau dealer. I, I, I just found... I just happened to know the recap... Like, people who... I know who isn't and is for this particular doll, so I used them to show the example. Here's some differences. They're talking a lot about what, the, what they know about their relationship about Dal Chateau. Mint on Card is very, very invested in that. They're also talking a lot about what you can and cannot do, what they can do for you in case of, for problem resolution. Another, and they tell you exactly what everything that comes with. The other, the other site it didn't really show you. They don't have these details. Thank you very much for stopping by. I have to get to the other room. Yeah, and if you look on the prices on the other end for the full set, like this isn't even a full set price. This is the blank doll. A blank doll chateau doll should cost six hundred dollars new. And then once we get a face up, we're now at six hundred and fifty nine dollars. So the price difference there, if you kind of get a feeling for what the price should be, and if it looks like a good steal, just do a little due diligence to make sure you're getting the product that you're intending to pay for. We're not here to judge what you do, but we want to let you give you the tools to make an informed decision about what am I looking at. And to know what you are doing. Yes. So right. you don't get, so you're not going in saying, I'm going to get a this quality piece from Dal Chateau because I know what they do. Put money for it, go through all this effort, and then receive something that isn't what you were trying to find. Yeah, that would be not cool. Ha! So there's the price. So there's also the secondhand market. These things are expensive! And you They're can, expensive! They are. And even when and we have to go a little the, quickly because we're near the end of our time slot. So Are, are we, uh, did we? Oh, yeah, we started at four. Yes. So even with a secondhand market, there's not usually that much in a depreciation in value on these guys. It depends on the doll. Yeah. Some dolls are considered a little bit more common than others or less desired, so to speak. Those can be, you can find them at steel prices on the secondhand market. And by steel, I mean if a, a doll started at 400, you might be looking at. 150. Uh, I'm not 200? Old. 150 or 200 is, is if it's yellowed or aged As, Or badly. has other other potentially right. maybe so imperfections. I see, I see $400 dolls going for like 300 to 350 So you can get a pretty stiff discount if you go onto the secondhand market. Or if you miss a limited you fell in love with, there's a lot of buyer's remorse. Because people will impulse buy and you can find them secondhand as well. Yes. So here's what you need to look for when you're doing secondhand buying. 
One, look for good feedback on the seller. You want to see that other people have done exchanges with this seller and they've always followed through. Or if they have had an issue that they've been quick to resolve it because we're dealing with a lot of money in the end. And you don't want to go through a process with somebody who has a history of saying, I have this doll. No, I don't. But, and then there's a whole issue that you have to go through to get your money back. And there is people that actually sit there and scam and like say they're going to send you <laughs> the doll and you gave them the money. It's crazy. There's Some people, people are, are like really predatory. Yes. Um, um, so another, second, yes. to make sure your, your feedback is correct and you're good, you want to be on an actively modded forum. That means anyone with bad or terrible feedback or awful predator or jerk faces are kicked from <laughs> you the wanna forum. You want to see reputations and you want to see mods who are actively saying... We, we keeping an eye on what's going on. Sometimes you can resolve an issue by getting the mods involved and acting, having them act as a third party. Um, number three, we were just talking about, is it too good to be true? So if your four hundred dollar doll is now one hundred dollars, either there's something drastically wrong with the doll, or it might not be what it says it is, or it might not be a recast. But sometimes it really is the real doll, and someone doesn't know the true price of what they're putting on the secondhand market. So there is that possibility. But keep it in mind and do the due diligence so that you aren't committing to something when someone's not telling exactly the full facts to you. So something you can check for is a lot of dolls will have um, what is called a head plate. And Maya has one. Yes. And it, yeah, she's new. <laughs> and they actually, um, a lot of them have numbers. And from the numbers, you can actually trace when they were made, where they were made, for what reason they were made, if there are limited editions. Other ones will have certificates of authenticity sent with the dolls. You this happens to be for this dude over here. So you can he ask has this picture on it. A picture of that. He's numbered and signed. However, this didn't quite come into, all these practices didn't quite come into being until after... Um, after like recapping, 2003 became, like 2002 2003 so and one thing you can look at and you can request photos i, I had a great uh, if you're really like if you're really invested in having what you consider to be a legitimate company product mm -hmm. you can always ask the seller yes and uh this is something that had great success with on ebay on purchasing older volk dolls a lot of dolls have markings on the inside to mark what model they are and other things on a recast those will be changed and marred because you're pouring on the inside and they'll get smaller. And I like move around a little bit and so not be precise. Lovely and carefully pass this head cap around. You can look at the markings on the inside of the head cap. At the end of the panel, you're allowed to come up and look at everybody. Yes. Um, <laughs> Just so you know. Okay, so now um, on to PayPal. Um, one thing that you want to do when you're doing a transaction, always PayPal as goods and services, not as a gift. That Goods and services means that within 30 days, if you have not received the doll, you can open up a claim with PayPal and dispute it. And if you don't get the doll, you may at least get your money back. If you do it as a gift, you're out of luck. Nothing you can do. Yes. Um, pay also on PayPal, sellers are responsible for eating those fees, uh, the additional fees, technically. And yeah. if you're doing a layaway, the only the last payment, only payments within the 30 days are going to, like, be, be effective to, right for for a refund if something goes wrong so if you have a four month you have a third you have a 30 day limit on your ability to make a claim with paypal as goods and services yeah so, so, you're, so you're paying over time only the last payment within the 30 days is when you can dispute yes uh yes yeah <laughs> has everyone been able to have a chance to look at them yeah okay um, one thing you also want to make keep in mind in any kind of payment that you're making internationally, what are the fees? What are the transaction fees? There may be fees for changing U.S. dollars into the native currency. Not always, but there may be fees for that depending on who you're talking with and how big a company they're working with. And you also want to know it's not as important in the U.S. because we're not as intense about it. What are my local custom fees? Because that's going to be part of the budgeting that you need to do. Yeah. So we don't really have a lot of time to talk about Volks right now, but we're going to let you know Volks works a little differently from all other co other companies. They're the kind of the grandparent of the hobby, and they take that position, and they know that position. Yeah, they kind of started out, um, there was standard models, but they started out really from a resin kit kind of standpoint where you bought everything separately and painted everything yourself. Then yes. they graduated from that into what they call the standard, standard model, model, which comes with wig, eyes, face up, and a very basic kind of like 
dress. Yeah, it's almost like a pajama. But slip. you have no choices. No, the eyes are going to be random eyes. The face up is standard for their for that particular standard, and the wig is also random. Um, so that's what they're doing now. It used to be that the eyes and wig were always the same for the model that you got. They changed it up a little now. Yeah. Um, they also offer limited models, and the limited model model for Volks works a little differently from everyone else because they work in small numbers with high demand. They've moved to what's called a lottery system. So you compete for the chance to pay for something. You, it, it, you literally, there's a box. I've gone through this process at least once. There is a box. You walk into an event. They do something very specific to Volk called a doll party. You can. It's in a big event where a lot of fan, like people who make things for the dolls, will come together, and we have and a they'll whole do special. episode on it. If you would like to listen, we to do. Us. We talk about a whole episode on Ningyo Bingyo. Yes. If you want to hear about what a doll party is like, if you're intrigued about this thing we're talking about very briefly, um, they do limited releases at the doll parties. The only way to buy that release is to walk into the doll party, take a number. That number is your place in line, and if the doll is not sold out before you get to your number in line, you can buy it. And that's as exciting and upsetting as it may sound like. As we mentioned earlier, Amy Ayase is a doll pal limited. I tried. There's Sometimes you get multiple chances to go at this. I tried three times. Yes. Uh, speaking about multiple chances, there's something called an after event, where if all of them aren't sold during the event, you will once again enter into a lottery to see if you have the chance to give them your gosh darned money to get what you want. <laughs> um, um, these are usually run through the websites, and they'll have specific ways that they work. And sometimes they'll be on the international website as well. Very briefly, we are not going to get into it because this is a somewhat complicated. There's something called the full choice system with folks. It means you can choose whatever head you want with whatever body. Well, within a limited, they usually have like about 40 heads that you can choose from. From. Which is a lot, actually. And then they have body types and all the sizes. The bodies do have options within them, like chest size, limb length, some longer legs or not. It, that's why it's called full choice. It's only available in Japan in person if you live there, except for the U.S. limited full choice event. There's actually going to be one in May. Ta-da! And if But the have. full choice, the online full choice system for the United States has nowhere near the same amount of options as the full, 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 full choice. Yes, she was a full <laughs> choice that I purchased in Japan. When you're in Japan, it's not enough to actually be, be in there. Japan. You, you have, have to, to have live a, there. Well, you have to have a mailing address that you can send the gosh darn thing to afterwards. Because these are bespoke be... items. They're one of a kind. They ask you what what face up you want. They ask you what wig you want. You special specify for everything. They make her just for you, and they mail her to you four months later. Four to six, depending on the waiting period. Yeah, I was lucky. It was almost closer to three. But I was actually able to describe that I wanted her face up like this special edition. Please do it pink. Make her feel energetic like a young girl and yes. things like that. But the online the online full choice system doesn't let you do any of that because they can't talk to you in person, and that's too much risk for them. You're back to style A and style B kind of thing. Yeah. You can choose a style A, style B, and it'll be different every face. And they don't give you the full range of options that you normally get. Mm-hmm. So in conclusion, what yes. should you keep in mind when you're trying to buy your first ball jointed doll do your research yes look at the company look at the seller think about your money options look at the second hand market see if they're showing up there give yourself options because you're worth it <laughs> and this is sometimes it's a 500 to 1000 dollar purchase and that's a commitment and you want to make sure you're doing it exactly the way you want to do it for you do make a budget for yourself if you know that you're eyeballing a company that you really love, you'll know the average price of what their dolls cost. Start putting away. Don't go to Starbucks every week. You'd yes. be <laughs> don't don't eat out. Eat, don't eat out for a few months. Wait Take that, that money and put it into <laughs> a lot of bank accounts will allow you to make a separate bank account that's just for savings. Like you can have multiple savings accounts sometimes at certain at certain banks. Set aside the doll savings account. Put aside five bucks every week. In a year or two, you'll have enough to buy anything you want. And also, please do consider accessory costs. Like we said, the basic model is not... <laughs> the car comes basic. Everything else is extra. Please note how he's still nude. How long have you had this doll, lovely? I have had no money. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> moving on entirely from that subject. <laughs> please do listen to your passions. Just Some companies have a bad rep for their style because they're a very unique style. Doll Chateau has people who love them and people who hate them. But don't let what's popular dictate what's good for you and what you really get struck by. This is an investment, and it can be a very emotional investment as well. 
let yourself listen to what you like and what's good for you. If you really like really cool vampires with visual K hair and like a like very straight jaws and a very muscular build, you fucking buy that. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't. Yeah, and just don't, <laughs> and don't I'm try, very, try not to feel too bad when they say your doll looks like a girl when it's a guy. It's like this is for you. This is your luxury item for you, and it's very customizable. Take advantage of it. Do it exactly the way you want to do it. And if and finally, don't impulse buy. When something's new and special, we talked about this during our last panel, you get this level, lovely rush of dopamine, which is totally intrinsic in making you want to impulse buy something. Impulse buys make small bank accounts. Yes. Uh, and, and everybody knows this because we have... We are all at an anime convention, and we have dealer's rooms, and we see what our wallets are like after we leave the dealer's room. <laughs> On a multi-day convention, I would even say it's wiser to look at it the first day, and if there's a chance it'll be there the second day, mm-hmm. come back and see if Limit- you really yeah. want it. Really Limiteds want it. <laughs> are really hard, too, because they are only open for a certain amount of time. But if it, if it was meant to be, it will be there the next day when you know you have that bank account ready. Or, or if you've been saving, you know what you have in your bank, and the limited pops up, and you know you have $700 in your bank account just for this, then snap it up. You'll feel a lot better in the long run. Or just uh, wait on it, know that you don't have the money at the moment, start saving, and somebody will have made a snap decision or eventually grow bored of their doll, and you can get it on the second-hand market. Let someone else impulse buy. Mm-hmm. You can take advantage of that afterwards. Yes. Well, a good idea is if you really want a doll, sleep on it one night. At least give yourself one night, a day to pass, to kind of think about it and let it settle on you. you. If you feel the same way the next day, wait until you feel comfortable with what you're doing. Don't let a limited edition push you into something, because I guarantee you in a month it will be on the Den of Angels market and it will be fine. And somebody's going to save a whole lot on shipping. Yes, because it's coming from inside the United States. Um, like earlier, don't worry about trends. Right now, the Celine Mini Fay happens to be a... There we go. You know the Celine. She's very popular right now. She's beautiful. But don't buy her just because she's popular. Buy her because you also love her for the same and your own unique reasons. And don't ever buy without researching your seller. This has happened to a friend of mine, a really quick story. Um, she's been looking for a really rare, un- like, not a limited doll, but they're not made anymore, Dylan from Ring Doll. We found one, finally, on DeviantArt, which is the first bad sign. And as, she went <laughs> and as she went through this process of giving them money, the doll wasn't coming. And the doll wasn't coming. And we did a little bit more research, because we kind of did an impulse buy. I was helping her find this. And it turns out they have horrible feedback everywhere, if you look up their screen name. Good end to this story, she went onto a modded, actively modded community, put up a post saying, does anybody know this person? Can they help me find out what's going on? She'd already paid them, and she could not get that money back because she didn't pay for it as goods and services. Somebody who was a friend of a friend of the person seller said, I'll get this for you, went to that person's house because they knew where they lived, knocked on their door and said, hey, where's that person's doll? Lo and behold, a week later... The doll arrives. Unfortunately, it now has lots of bad feelings attached to it. It's Actually, she's fine. Oh, she's better. She's now. okay. And initially, she was kind of a little <laughs> iffy about keeping the doll because because it, a, it was such a big deal to go through. Yeah. It was a lot of money to put down. But let that be a warning to you. A lot of don't drama. do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Always research your seller. And if you are interested in hearing more from us, if you have questions for us, because we've had to blast through a lot of things, if you want to submit questions for the podcast or hear us talk about. We have about four episodes up about different ball-jointed doll-related things. If you're curious about hearing a more academic kind of view, this is kind of info-dumpy. But we kind of do academic, like, where did this come from? What was the context? We do it on a podcast that's somewhat monthly, about a monthly. And if you put us, Nino Bingo, into Google, you will find us there. Yes, very easily. I think the first hit. Yes. You'll also find the uh, listing for this panel at this convention. That's great. Well, I hope we got you pumped up, maybe to buy your first doll, maybe your second doll, maybe your fifth doll, maybe your 20th doll. Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, We hope you had a lot of fun and however many dolls you have and however many you will get. Remember to keep having fun, but keep a budget.